thank you for joining us today for uh, a tremendous opportunity here uh, led by um, Milton Cohen and David Sneed. The company is called Caring Closings. Uh, sorry, the company is called Caring Closures. And um, they have uh, been very successful in raising capital so far. They've raised uh, about $7 million and they have a current round that's open. Um, Today's meeting is scheduled for one hour, depending on the Q&A portion, we can keep the meeting going for as long as you folks would like. Um, as mentioned earlier, we are recording the meeting and we will follow up with an email to you later today with the deck, as well as the link so you can watch it again and share it with other investor colleagues. Um, our co-host today is Skylar. So if you have any questions or issues, you can private chat with Sky or myself. You can feel free to put your questions right into the chat box itself or private message with Sky and she will coordinate that. Uh, the company will present for about 20 minutes and then we'll have the moderated Q&A session. And about halfway through the Q&A session, we'll conduct a confidential poll. We're not gonna release the results except to the presenting company. Uh, we'll do a confidential poll to gauge investor interest. So please do respond. And uh, like I said, we, this is confidential. A um, little bit about caring closures. So over 50 years ago, and I do remember this well, um, personally, uh, child resistant cap and closure standards were developed in a response to an ep epidemic of child overdoses on flavored baby aspirin. And uh, with these new standards, this resulted in a 45% reduction in US child mor mortality. And it proved that access control is super effective um, as early intervention. So fast forward today, 50 years later, pharma has created addictive medications. Um, teens are sneaking pills from the medicine cabinet, which is now the number one source of teen drug abuse for over a decade. And in addition, every eight minutes, a child goes to the emergency room from a drug or supplement poisoning. The detergent manufacturers have created uh, pod formulations and every 36 minutes, a child goes to the ER. So overall, with over 50 years of innovation in computer products, or consumer products, today a child is poisoned every 12 seconds by a household consumer product. It's obviously a huge problem. And Caring Closures International sees this opportunity to update this 50-year-old access control device and prove an early intervention and solve these epidemic scale public health problems on 14 billion packaging units annually on a global basis. So why invest in the company? Here are some key investor considerations. First of all, the company has a strong and defensible IP portfolio, 11 issued patents with two more pending, including a patent on the lowest cost locking cap and closure mechanism. Okay, terrific. Uh, thanks, uh, Sky, and also thanks, Tian, for having us today. I'm Milton Cohen. I'm the CEO here at uh, Caring Closures, or CCI for short. Uh, I'm joined by my colleague, David Sneed, who assists me with investor relations and all things fundraising. Uh, David, you can wave and say hello. Um, here at uh, CCI, a couple of headlines before we jump into the uh, story and business. Uh, in the bottom right of your screen, we were named a most fundable company, one of 50 winners out of over 4,500 third-party nominated companies nationwide. Uh, and then separately in the very far right uh, bottom corner of your screen, we were also named a Colorado company to watch, one of 50 winners out of over a thousand third party nominated companies uh, here in our home state of Colorado. Uh, here at CCI, we are bringing a 50 year innovation into the cap and closure market in access control uh, as an early intervention device in really epidemic scale public health problems. Uh, and so just to uh, kick us off, to give us some context on uh, 50 years and what that means, I put a little ensemble together here. And so 50 years ago in 1970, the Chiefs won the Super Bowl. It was Super Bowl IV. Um, in addition, uh, Elvis Presley was still alive. There he is visiting Nixon uh, in the Oval Office. It was the first Nixon administration. So Watergate and the nomenclature was still just an office building. And then finally, as Tian mentioned, in the 60s, we were having a huge epidemic scale public health problem with children overdosing on aspirin. And the story there is aspirin's bitter to taste. 
kids wouldn't take it, so mothers complained. Uh, and then, so the manufacturers responded by flavoring it like candy. And as soon as they flavored it like candy, kids started taking it like candy, and you can overdose on aspirin. And so back then, we moved very, very quickly. And we passed uh, the child resistant standards in the Poison Prevention Packaging Act of 1970, covering a very broad cross section of consumer products from prescription drugs pictured here on the left of your screen, all the way into common household products pictured on the right of your screen. But we only required that 85% or more of five year olds and younger couldn't open the container. But it generated a 45% reduction in US child mortality highly effective early intervention that proved access control as an early intervention and device uh, in healthcare. And uh, it was considered so effective, in fact, at the time that the entire rest of the developed world followed suit, mimicking these regulations in their own um, uh, code of federal re regulations equivalent. Uh, and so today, all the world's caps and closures literally follow this now 50-year-old uh, antiquated standard. And where all the world today, fast forward, has forgotten and just sees everyday packaging, here at CCI, we see an opportunity to update that 50-year-old antiquated access control device and intervene in continuing and on uh, new public health problems that have, ha uh, have occurred and started since then. Uh, like the opioid epidemic, which you've all heard of, which you may not have heard of, is that children, teenagers sneaking pills out of the medicine cabinet has been the number one source for teen drug abuse in our country since 2012. It's almost two times the rate at which teens buy drugs from a drug dealer. Fast forward, continuing today, we have a continuing problem with uh, pediatric poisonings every eight minutes. A child goes to the ER here in the US from a drug or supplement poisoning and every 12 seconds, a child is poisoned from a common household product. These issues cost our economy and healthcare system tens of billions of dollars a year. And literally all of them can be contained with simple access control. And so we're starting with prescription drugs with our SafeRx line of locking prescription vials sold to pharmacies that use them in filling prescriptions behind the counter. I'll say that again, in filling prescriptions behind the counter. They're pictured here in our teen-proof version on the left and our child-proof version on the right. A four-digit code is 10,000 combinations on the left. Very sufficient to keep ten teens out, 100% effective in, in teen-proof testing. Uh, similarly, 100 combinations with a two-ring closure pictured on the right, vastly sufficient to keep out uh, children uh, from uh, uh, from uh, pediatric poisoning, uh, high-risk products. So that's where we're starting, but we expect to roll it out a lot more broadly into consumer product packaging via licensing our 11 patents uh, across the entire cap and closure universe, creating a business of massive size and massive impact. And so here on the left, you can see our prescription dispensing line, our SafeRx line has a 5 billion revenue opportunity globally uh, and can prevent uh, 7 million teens aged 12 to 17 from initiating drug abuse here in the United States over a 10 year period, if implemented solely for opioids alone. Uh, fast forward on the right, our uh, licensing business at our mature market shares, we believe we can distribute, uh, I'll say again, distribute almost 890 million in distributions to our investors for every dime in average royalty rate. And we can literally create a world in which kids don't ever go to the hospital again from a poisoning event. And so we'll focus the majority of our time talking about the SafeRx dispensing business today, but a little on the licensing too. Uh, the, um, we've established ourselves as really the market leader in the locking vial category with account leadership in our dispensing line shown on the left, growing national and trade media recognition. We finished this year a little under a quarter million in revenue. We're budgeting 66% uh, growth uh, for 2022 almost exclusively in our dispensing line. Our growth strategy for 2022 and forward is to prioritize clinical verticals that are focused on outcomes as opposed to economics and profitability. And there's several examples of these that we'll get into in a moment. While supporting, importantly, two pathways towards nationwide adoption, either reimbursement 
or supporting a regulatory update to those 1970 standards. We call them our two R's here, and both of those would be tipping points for nationwide adoption of locking vial dispensing. But we'll focus now on clinical verticals, and I'll show you a couple of examples of some of uh, our evangelist customers in a moment. But this is how we think about it. We move uh, verticals from the evaluation phase to testing, where we already have customers, and we're just testing the best sales strategy and then to execution where we're growing those. And so right now we have about 280 plus million of uh, revenue potential just from the clinical vo uh, vertical growth strategy alone. And in the markets that we're focused on now, which are treatment centers and FQHCs, we have some evangelist customers already that are either doing uh, multiple referrals in their communities for us. They are uh, supporting uh, statewide pilots of locking vial dispensing to test for reimbursement, or they are presenting thought leadership presentations at clinical conferences around the country for us on their uh, vial programs. And so here are some from the FQHC vertical. Here are some evangelist customers that we have in the treatment center vertical. We'll be adding those uh, evangelist customers in both um, uh, the local government sector and also in uh, dental surgery which are the two uh, verticals that are now in testing phase. Uh, but then we also have this pathway in our two R's for nationwide adoption that we're working on, whether it's through reimbursement via our pending pilots shown here on the left, the top three shaded in blue are uh, already funded and in development. I'm most excited about the two that are labeled CMMI. That's the Innovation Center at CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid. Those uh, two projects will be testing specifically for reimbursement. Uh, and then separately, the second R on the right, uh, we have a pending legislation in California that we expect to pass this year that re would require locking vial dispensing for any Schedule II controlled substance prescription in the state with some small carve outs for institutions. It's a full mandate for Schedule II dispensing and locking vials. Uh, California does about 25 million Schedule II scripts a year. This would take us to 30 plus million in revenue and over 5 million in EBITDA as, a, a, as the uh, policy went effective. And it would also establish two pa uh, pathways to nationwide adoption via either of these two agencies shown here that have the statutory authority today to require it simply by rulemaking. We don't need an act of Congress in Washington, thank God. <laughs> so fast forward, uh, uh, focusing on clinical vertical growth while supporting uh, both reimbursement and regulatory for that major tipping point that can drive uh, substantial growth and, and a home run really for us. Here's a little bit on competition. What we've done here is we have taken uh, those products that compete with us in our consumer product line sold on Amazon and in retail. And we've uh, stack ranked them on uh, six criteria. The three over here on the right are regulatory requirements in the marketplace. The three over here are marketplace requirements. Uh, there are two products that could compete with us, Safer Lock and Apothecary, if they change their materials to comply with the regulatory standards over here. But neither of those two products can compete with us in the market factors that are most important here, which are effectively cost, cost, and cost. Uh, we have about a 10x manufacturing cost advantage versus our next, next closest competitor, Safer Lock, and about a 6x workflow cost advantage uh, versus that same competitor here. And so what we've done here is we've boxed the fatal flaws of each of these other consumer product line competitors in terms of competing with us at the point of dispensing in the dispensing marketplace. And so we expect to really own this market as we create it. This is what our base case revenue looks like. And this uh, assumes no reimbursement and no regulation, solely growth from our clinical verticals uh, growth strategy and 50% uh, weighted uh, growth from the program development pilots that are uh, in development right now. And so we can get to 13 to 15 million plus or minus by 26, 27, uh, solely with that growth strategy without uh, reimbursement or regulation. But here's what happens uh, if we're able to achieve reimbursement or regulation. You can see those base case projections fall all the way down here and reimbursement or regulation for Schedule II drugs to start, just Schedule II drugs is worth about $330 million here in the United States. 
So a uh, very big home run uh, if we can achieve this in the forecast horizon. I think we'll certainly get to reimbursement by 26 or 27, and we'll probably have an outside chance of getting there by 24 or 25. It's important to note uh, that was just for Schedule II dispensing, that $330 million. Uh, if we uh, achieve reimbursement for Schedule II, we would expect to achieve it for the entire controlled substance spectrum, starting with Schedule IV benzodiazepines and then the remainder of controlled substances, generating around a 700 million opportunity for us here in the US. And then it's important to note that if we achieve reimbursement for controlled substances and teen proof files, we would expect to achieve reimbursement for pediatric fatality risk medications on those two ring vials that we showed you up front. And that takes us to a 2 billion revenue opportunity uh, here in the United States with reimbursement for locking vial dispensing on any pediatric fatality risk medication and on any controlled substance for child-proof and teen-proof versions of our vials. Uh, so very important to know that Schedule II is really just the start for us. And we can effectively almost take over in its entirety the, uh, the file market with our IP. Speaking of IP, we have a, a port current portfolio of 11 issued patents. We have two in development. Uh, the dark blue shading that you see in this strategy wheel is what our 11th patent brought us. It issued late last year. Uh, uh, it brought a sleeving of vials. So just like you sleeve uh, cups together at a backyard barbecue or you buy them in the store, or you get them from a fast food vendor. We uh, have patented sleeving vials, and we believe that can take up to 50% of the supply chain costs uh, out of uh, fulfillment for us. What it also bought us, though, uh, was this two or more ring uh, coverage, which brought us into that tertiary market for any consumer product that has pediatric fatality risk, right? Uh, and so that's uh, the big, bigger opportunity in licensing for us. About 14 billion units a year that we could potentially license onto at our mature market shares. We'll show you that in a minute. Uh, at our mature market shares, we believe we'll get at least 10 billion out of that. But uh, we're focused uh, first to start on OTC drugs and supplements and detergent pods in terms of categories where we have an ER visit every eight minutes and every 36 minutes respectively here in the United States from a pediatric poisoning. So that two ring advancement uh, in our IP portfolio was very, very significant for us. Um, and that's where we're going to be focused first. So what does that look like? Well, at our mature market shares, like I said, we think we can get to a little over 10 billion units. For every dime in average royalty rate here in the center of your screen, we can distribute, I'll say again, distribute almost 890 million uh, to our investors annually. It's because licensing is so high margin. You only basically have sales and marketing and deal costs, uh, any audit costs that are not picked up by your licensees, and then any brand and awareness costs that you have behind that. So very, very high margin distributable cash flow uh, from the licensing opportunity. And that's what makes exit so beautiful for us. Uh, so we would expect to exit the vial business for somewhere between a nine and 10 digit exit, uh, somewhere in the 26 plus or minus time frame, depending on where we are in that universe of drug uh, uh, classes of drugs that are covered. Uh, we would sell the, uh, the vial business with an exclusive license to use the IP very narrowly defined it's solely in prescription vials while retaining that IP for continued monetization uh, via licensing over time uh, with high distributable cash flow, as we've talked about. What we're really looking for in the longer term is to match our capital structure strategy uh, against this corporate strategy and licensing. And so we are looking at for a family office instead of a VC. We're specifically looking for a family that has depletable assets or a, a large real estate portfolio that is generating unused passive losses in their portfolio that they could use to offset our distributions for tax, making it highly tax efficient from a, a return perspective uh, for that class of investor. And that's the kind, type of partner we're looking for in the long term in our next uh, financing round after this one. A little bit uh, on uh, leadership myself. So I started my career in the old Chase Capital before the chemical bank merger in the mid 90s doing buyout stage investing, uh, private equity investing and specialty manufacturing and business services back when you could have the bank as your effective sole limited. Fast forward, I went into the global investment bank after the chemical bank merger and did M&A and leverage finance primarily for packaging issuers with a focus on plastic films producers. 
Uh, I left the bank when they asked me to go to London for three years, went back to multi a multifamily office and did principal investing at buyout stage and growth equity, uh, focused on healthcare services and business services again, before becoming an independent sponsor. Uh, after uh, we exited the last uh, por portfolio company uh, of mine, I was reloaded here to Denver to do a larger turnaround in travel services. Uh, and very serendipitously met the inventor of the SafeRx product, who's a practicing anesthesiologist up in Fort Collins. And because I have a personal story in my extended family around the opioid epidemic, I was highly compelled to partner with him and commercialize his invention. Uh, Jason uh, joined me uh, two years ago now, uh, Stanford MBA. He ran the Horizon Milk and Silk Milk brands for White Wave Foods prior to its sale for Dean to Dean. Uh, about a 400 million PL. Uh, since leaving after the Dean acquisition, he uh, has launched several different products into US retail, uh, most with, uh, with uh, successful exits uh, in multiple categories. So, great fit for us. He's been a great partner for me. A um, couple of uh, highlights here uh, of other investors in the current round to give you some comfort on the, uh, on the expertise that's coming into the business. I'm going to start at the bottom with Chris Demos, an investor since 2016. He's done his pro rata every round. Uh, he was uh, conflicted from joining my board until last year because he was uh, running a business unit for McKesson. And McKesson is a customer of ours. Uh, we sell through them uh, to many customers. And uh, he was conflicted from joining the board. But as soon as uh, he left McKesson to now serve as COO at Accent Care, uh, I recruited him to the board as well. So uh, he is a proven name in US pharmacy ran super value pharmacy, ran super value, then ran that business unit for McKesson and has maintained his uh, position in healthcare at the C-level. Uh, separately, Rob Falkenberg, a YPO colleague of mine and uh, Tien's, 35 plus years in managed care, most recently serving as CEO of United Healthcare California, investing personally in this round and joining uh, the board uh, as well. So great validating investors. There are many others like them, but uh, a couple of quick highlights uh, from the current group uh, to give you some comfort. Uh, this uh, round is a 3 million total round. We only have about a million to a million and a half left, depending on what we uh, close on that's already in the pipeline. Uh, the nominal pre-money is 10, although we do have a special warrant promote available to investors of uh, half a million or more, it gets them a, an effective pre-money of eight and a half million. Uh, I just want to bring it back to, um, to mission for a moment before we uh, uh, finish up and open it up for questions. You know, 10 years from now, I expect our packaging to be as ubiquitous as child resistant caps and closures are today across the world. And if we're successful doing that, we're going to save tens of millions of children and teenagers uh, from a number of different issues uh, that they might encounter in their lives. Uh, so I hope that you join us in our important mission uh, in solving these problems. Uh, that concludes my prepared remarks, uh, Tien and Sky. Uh, thank you all for listening. I'm happy to take any questions that you have at this point. Thank you so much, Milton. Um, so as you saying, yeah, we'll move on to the, the Q&A section. Um, so our first question is, what's Milton's plan for household products and its time horizon? Uh, great, great question. So I'm going to uh, run you back here to our IP uh, slide just so it's up for everybody. Uh, so right now, those two additional patents that we're doing, uh, plus some continuation claims in the current one, are to uh, uh, close a couple of uh, little holes around the edges on what's already been issued. Uh, as soon as we do that, we expect to uh, finish those claims this in this first quarter we're going to start test marketing probably in the second half of this year and with a resource light approach. Right now, we're highly focused on growing the SafeRx product line. Um, but if we, if we do get lucky enough with a uh, test market hit uh, later this year, keep in mind the time frame for a deal uh, is, is pretty long. It's probably about a year of uh, testing and getting the deal done, having them there do their due diligence, et cetera, decide, making the decision. And then there's probably at least another nine months of uh, working with their packaging providers. Many of them outsource the packaging, um, uh, their packaging. And so that it's as much as uh, about, it's as much as two years really before we would see any licensing revenue and royalty flow uh, just by virtue of the marketplace. And that six to nine months importantly is that that packaging provider is going to need to tool up to be able to make the parts that go into the packaging because these are all 
effectively injection or glow molded, uh, glow molded plastic parts at the end of the day. So uh, we'll test market in the second half of the year, but it is a very long uh, deal process and sales cycle until you start to see royalty cash flow. Okay, great. Thanks, Milton. Mm -hmm. um, the next question is, can you talk about your product and other competitive advantages and their IP protection? How are you differentiated? Yeah, so let me go back to that competition slide for everyone. Um, so we have effectively patented the lowest cost locking cap enclosure mechanism that you could engineer uh, for two or more rings, which is 100 or more combinations. I'm going to tell you a, a couple of different things. We, we did had our engineers do teardown analyses on all three of these consumer products, right? Um, it costs Safer Lock, our next closest competitor, literally $5.50 uh, to build the parts and to put the labor on assembly. Uh, that compares to our fully assembled landed cost US of about 45 cents on average at scale, depending on our vial size because most of the cost, marginal cost is just materials that goes into these things. So we literally have about a 10X manufacturing cost advantage versus our next closest competitor. And by the way, all of this data, our uh, teardown analyses, a lot of information is in the VDR, in our virtual data room, which we make available under NDA to, um, to larger investors. Uh, so you're welcome to review all of that in due diligence. But we also, uh, uh, it takes behind the counter that in the workflow cost column, it's important to note about a 6x workflow cost advantage because this closure mechanism here uh, requires the uh, encoder, the pharmacist or tech to insert an Allen wrench into a very tiny hole, depress a lever, hold that lever down and then scramble the rings. Uh, it takes about 45 seconds for a trained person to do that. Uh, our uh, encoding solution behind the counter, which will ultimately move to robotic, uh, but current in its current manual form is only about 10 seconds for a trained um, for a trained tech or pharmacist to encode that cap with a patient pin number. And so, uh, so again, about 10x manufacturing cost advantage, about a 6x workflow cost advantage. We're also, and this is very important, once you move beyond schedule two in that uh, middle column robotics adaptability, we believe we're the only product that's suitable uh, for robotic dispensing, which is important uh, after schedule two mostly don't go through robots, but the rest for mail order and central fill operations, it's very important to have a robotics capability. And we're the only product among the uh, four that you see here that have that capability. I also want to, in answering your question, tell you the story of Apothecary Products, this last competitor down here, because it really validates the, um, the strength of our IP portfolio. So Apothecary came to us in 2017 with an approach to acquire us. Uh, we had just uh, uh, really launched on the marketplace. We were still uh, getting the right size uh, developed and tooling for the, uh, for the right size vial for the marketplace. Um, we said, no, it was way too early. They said, well, can we license your IP so that we can uh, you know, launch a product of our own? Uh, we said, okay, and we got into discussions with them. As background, Apothecary Products is the 80% category share leader in US retail in the medication management category. So these are your seven day pill organizers, your 14 day pill organizers, pill cutters, pill fobs, et cetera. 80% uh, category share leader. We get into due diligence and it came, comes out in uh, you know, one of our lunches or dinners that uh, they had spent about a year and a half trying to design and engineer uh, a locking vial and couldn't get around our IP. Uh, for the right solution. And so what happened was we didn't get to terms on the licensing deal, but fast forward uh, about nine to uh, 12 months later, they came out with the product that you see pictured here, which uses one of those uh, old circular aperture burglar alarm locks, right? And so they couldn't, and here's the category share leader in medication management telling us that they can't engineer around our IP. Great validating, uh, you know, story. Uh, I was still early in the business. I was about a year in. And so at that point, I, you know, any doubts I had about our IP uh, went out, went right out the window. Uh, so a uh, great answer is great IP portfolio with great cost advantages. Uh, and uh, it's something that will persist across uh, all these categories. Um, Sky, is, um, do you have another one? Yeah. Um, so this one kind of um, goes off of your last question a little bit, but 
It is how are you able to achieve an eight to 10 times manufacturing cost advantage? Sure. So, um, so great question. So that safer lock product is about 13 or 14 uh, parts, some plastic, some metal. Ours is three parts, all plastic. Uh, and ours are just injection molded parts. Uh, and so uh, the assembly automation as we scale to four and eight cavity tooling, which is effectively next uh, for California, brings us down from our current, which is 57 and 90 cents, depending on the size, uh, in terms of fully assembled landing costs, down to about 45 cents on average uh, between the two sizes. So um, it's really about part count and what it costs to make those parts and then the labor that goes into assembly. And with three parts all plastic, you know, our assembly process is super simple. Theirs is not so much. That's okay. the basis for the cost advantage in manufacturing. Great, thank you. Um, the next question is, are you or your competitors hiring lobbyists to push for federal and state legislation and regulations? And if so, what have been the results? Yeah, so we, uh, we have had a lot of good results. We've had a lot of frustrations in government affairs, as you might expect. I'm just going to go back to this page so you can see California. So, um, I'll, and I'll talk mostly about the California legislation, but we have uh, lobbyists in Ohio. Uh, we have a program manager in North Carolina, and we have a program manager based in Mo uh, Montana that handles uh, Mountain Pacific for us. Program managers in these situations are effectively the lobbyist equivalent. In Ohio, we first passed the pilot uh, in 2018 or 19, I wanna say. Uh, it passed uh, the legislature by 89 to three on the House side, I forget what the Senate side was. Uh, but this past year, it was funded to the tune of $2 million from the state legislature. Uh, Governor DeWine has pledged to use uh, opioid settlement money to bump up that budget. Uh, today is the deadline on the RFP. Uh, our uh, first choice, and uh, it's someone that we helped shoehorn in to run that pilot for Ohio, uh, is the Bloomberg School at uh, Hopkins. So they're submitting today. We've been working very, very closely with them. We've been working with our lobbyists and people in Ohio to make sure that they uh, uh, win it. Uh, I think having the best uh, number one public health school in the country is going to uh, really validate the data for uh, for both reimbursement and for efficacy and, and everything that we uh, want to see out of that. So we do have lobbyists in each of our states. Uh, I'll tell you one of our um, one of our failure frustration stories was in Michigan, where we had a 12 to 3 whip count to pass a full mandate uh, in the House Health Policy Committee, found out when uh, after the lame duck, when the chairman wouldn't schedule us for committee chairman wouldn't schedule us for a, uh, a voting hearing uh, that um, and this is, this is pure politics, you can't make it up. Uh, the bill sponsor, uh, one of our bill sponsors had, um, I guess said some inappropriate things at a fundraiser to the chairman's <laughs> committee chairman's wife. And so he wouldn't schedule us for a hearing because he had a grudge against uh, one of the bill sponsors. And so you run into things like that in politics. It's very, very non-linear. Uh, in California, we've been super successful. Uh, California is usually the first mover I think Oregon will be uh, right behind them. Uh, we've been doing some work in Oregon, Oregon with a lobbyist there, but California, we first started with Tom Umberg as our sponsor two years ago. Uh, Tom was the uh, uh, deputy drug czar under uh, Clinton. Uh, he's passed alongside uh, Dr. Arambula, our house side sponsor. Uh, so Tom Umberg, Senate side, Arambula and the ER doc from the Central Valley, who's now actually running for a federal seat uh, have passed most of the opioid legislation of the past seven years uh, together. Uh, and so it's the same coalition of support groups, CCAP, the addiction professionals and programs, uh, Shatterproof and some others, same coalition that's passed all their opioid legislation. What happened two years ago is COVID. Uh, so COVID basically sidelined everybody's bills except for emergency relief stuff. Um, fast forward last year, we just ran out of time uh, this year, uh, because of the accommodating amendments that we've made in the bill, some of which are great for us, um, the, uh, we expect a very limited to no opposition. Uh, and so that bill will be launched uh, here in January. It may have been launched already. We have an update call today. But uh, we expect that to pass right after the, uh, pass the House before the summer recess, and then pass the uh, Senate side right after the summer recess uh, with an effective date of April 1, 2023. 
Uh, and so that's, uh, you know, that's, a, a, you know, knock on wood, a super successful story for us. Ohio has been a successful story, but we have had our share of frustrations for sure. This is uh, working with government, unfortunately. Hopefully that that was long winded a little bit, Sky, but uh, hopefully that answered the question. If if you do have more questions on that, happy to take you through the full government affairs history that we've had, um, you know, across all the other states we've been active in as well. No, that, that was great. Thanks, Milton. Um, we have another question about your international expansion strategy. So yeah. it's asking what is what is your international expansion strategy and are there specific countries or markets you're targeting which would be more amendable to your solution? Yeah, absolutely. It's a great question. So, um, you know, the well, most of the developed world has an opioid problem. It's not as acute he as it is here in the States. Here in the States, we're 5% of the world's population. But believe it or not, we consume 80% of the world's controlled substances. So the problem is most acute here, but uh, what we would expect to do is focus on single payer environment, environments or concentrated payer environments. Um, and so I think uh, you know, National Health Service in UK would be a great place to start. We have plenty of people in Canada that want us to get started up there. Uh, you know, our international expansion will be kind of subject to success here in the States. Uh, because we need to focus all of our resources on getting the uh, the market here in the states up and running, and successful, and and hopefully path to profitability. Obviously, with uh, California or reimbursement or even the clinical vertical strategy. So we need to uh, focus on first things first. But international would be focused uh, uh, first on those markets that are uh, you know tertiary to us that can be fulfilled with the existing um, and uh, forward manufacturing plan, uh, which is Mexico and Shenzhen effectively. Uh, and then uh, after uh, proximitous, uh, it would be uh, also focused on uh, single payer uh, environments or, or environments that are most conducive to implementation on a, on an, on a solution by, like this. Okay, great. Thanks, Milton. Um, and then I'm going to continue with the Q&A, but I am going to put up a poll for our investors here today. So it will be confidential. So just feel free to answer the poll while we um, continue. So Milton, our next question is, what kind of progress have you made so far with respect to licensing prospects? How long are the deal cycles? Yeah, okay, so we, uh, we touched on this a little bit earlier, but I'm gonna take you back to that IP slide so, uh, so we can um, answer, uh, answer it visually as well here. So I said earlier, you know, we, are, uh, we have some continuation claims in the current uh, patent that we uh, need to get done. Those are being drafted right now. Uh, they'll be filed probably in the next 45 days. Uh, fast forward, we also have some new claims that'll go into a new patent family. Uh, and as soon as we get those two uh, jobs done, the continuation filings, and then also the, um, uh, sorry, I should say the continuation claims and also the uh, new patent claims, then that holds the place in line. That gives us full 100% confidence on uh, on basically a zero risk um, uh, test marketing uh, phase. So we start test marketing probably sometime in the second half would be my guess. And then the deal cycle is about probably a year to convince a brand that they need to do it um, because there's a lot of diligence they need to do. There's a lot of internal decision-making that needs to go on. These large organizations are effectively run by committee. Um, and so fast forward, call it a year for all of that to take place. And then decision, uh, by the way, during that year process, we would be negotiating for a due diligence deposit uh, to cover our time and to cover our engineering time to answer all of their questions, et cetera. So it's not a zero revenue situation. It's, uh, it's really you know, more costs being covered during that process. And then once a decision is made, uh, it would take six to nine months for uh, the packaging provider to that brand to tool up effectively uh, and modify their packaging lines and create the molds to make the new parts uh, for the cap enclosure. So call that about six to nine months, uh, depending on where it is and, and what complications they may have on, on uh, you know, the container um, uh, fit. Uh, and then so uh, call it six to nine months, after which presumably royal, royalties start to flow. Uh, on a per unit basis, or you know, we could also take the strategy of uh, trying to get a lot of that up front and then amortize that down over time in order to mitigate future fundraising requirements. 
So there's a lot of things that we can do in terms of these flexible deal structures on the licensing side, but the sales cycle is going to be a long one, starting with test marketing in the second half, and then about a year to two years of, uh, of deal and then tooling costs before they uh, hit the market and the shelves where you would see them. Okay, great. Um, next question says, what does your future capital plan look like? And when do you expect to raise a B round and how much with, and how much with what use of funds? Yep, perfect. So uh, this is our next round uh, uh, financing strategy. So we'll launch it sometime later this year. Uh, we'll target 5 million. We all already have several uh, co-investors, uh, family offices, some seed, seed stage impact uh, folks uh, that are uh, tracking us for this round and are just waiting for us to find a lead. So we're really still looking for that lead family office, um, but we have the co-investors there, two of which we would really like to have in the deal. Um, uh, we'll target 5 million in proceeds for that round. Uh, but with a ratchet up to 10 million of proceeds to the extent that California passes. And so what we'll try to negotiate into this next financing is effectively a company uh, put of equity or call on those additional 5 million of proceeds to capitalize the California pivot plan, which is also in our data room, uh, because we have to spend a lot very, very quickly. And we don't want to have to take the time to go out and do another round. And so we're trying to embed in this next round a structure that enables us to get to that 10 million of proceeds via an additional equity put to the institutional investors that are coming into that first 5 million. Uh, and so, um, so that's our, our contemplated structure and sizing for the next round. Of course, with that ratchet, or that equity put or the call on additional proceeds, we would also have a ratchet up in the valuation uh, when California passes so that uh, the dilution is, is minimized. Uh, and so that's our capital plan. We wouldn't need anything more in either case beyond the five or the 10 uh, in the case of California to get us to profitability. I mean, we, we expect to get to profitability in our clinical verticals growth plan alone. Uh, and the 5 million would fund that very sufficiently. Uh, so that's our capital plan for, for next round. Uh, this is of course, that would of course be a quote series A. Uh, and then uh, this current round is our C2 round. Okay, great. Thanks so much, Milton. Um, the next question is, what percentage of your future revenue is expected to be from the government? Uh, zero. Yeah, the, um, there would be no revenue from the government. We sell to, in our SafeRx line, to pharmacy providers. Um, Right now, it's all focused on clinical because they have the highest ROI from implementation, but ultimately retail pharmacy as well. Um, and then on the licensing side, it's uh, it depends on uh, how the deals are structured, but it's either going to be the revenue would be from either the brands themselves uh, or alternatively the packaging provider uh, to that brand just depends on deal structure. So ultimately zero government revenue. Okay. Um, after California passes, what is the next step for you in terms of sales, et cetera? Uh, so we have an entire California pivot plan that's like literally, I want to say 12 to 15 pages um, that uh, goes through all of our spending, all of our team hiring, all of the capital plan. Uh, it's not a lot of CapEx. You'd be surprised at uh, how, um, uh, how reasonable it is to build this, uh, to build these. And also keep in mind, you know, in contract manufacturing, once we have the contracts uh, from our customers, which would be a key focus of the interim period before uh, the effective date, um, you know, the contract manufacturer picks up the CapEx and just amortizes that cost to you over the life of your contract with them. So it's still, you, you would think that it was capital intensive, but it's a pretty capital light business at the end of the day. Uh, but yeah, the, uh, we have a whole plan for that. It includes uh, you know, hiring uh, at first as an, on a consulting basis, but then a, a manufacturing VP, uh, account management and business development personnel, both uh, hunters and keepers. Um, and then also uh, we would also uh, start hiring in government affairs uh, because what we would really want to do on a California win is push very, very hard uh, during the Democratic administration to, uh, to get one of those two agencies to, uh, to adopt this nationwide via rulemaking. 
So there's a lot of uh, team building that needs to go on. I think with our California pivot plan, we more than double in terms of headcount. Uh, and so then once California is done, the growth strategy would be kind of equally weighted uh, between reimbursement, maybe a little bit more in regulatory uh, to get us to that nationwide adoption uh, as quickly as possible. Because, you know, I think our exit nexus for all of you investors on the, on the call, our exit nexus is going to be where somebody's going to pay us enough of a premium to de that, uh, that we are happy not taking the risk of execution, right? And so I think that exit nexus probably comes once we have uh, proven Schedule 2 or there's visibility to Schedule 2 nationwide, but also visibility towards the rest of the uh, controlled substance and potential pediatric fatality risk uh, segments of the drug universe. And once we have visibility towards those, somebody should pay us a very huge premium uh, for, um, for it all in the vial business uh, uh, to, uh, to protect their uh, position in the marketplace. You know, there are two leaders today, Barry Plastics and Centaur Corporation in the vial market. And we would effectively, by taking over the vial market with our IP and that strategy, uh, you know, they, if they want to keep their position, they need to buy us for sure. And that's, so that's, that would be our strategy post California. And that's what really it takes to get uh, through California in terms of implementation. Okay, great. Thanks, Milton. Um, we have another question that has kind of a part A and part B to it. Um, and I also wanted to let the attendees know if you'd like to unmute and ask a question, um, feel free to or raise your hand and we can do that. Um, but while you're thinking, I will ask this question. Um, so I'll start with the, the first part of it that says, do you have a public relations and awareness plan to establish the SafeRx brand? Yes, we uh, we have a PR firm. We're actually meeting with them next Tuesday for the 2022 plan the planning session. Uh, yeah, we it's uh, it's integrated between digital, uh, between trade show, trade show is a big part of it, uh, between uh, clinical and the uh, thought leadership stuff. Uh, so yeah, we have an integrated uh, plan for executing on on building awareness, and it's you know it's focused on a, in a bunch of different areas as you might expect. It's not only in pharmacy; it's also in prescribers. Uh, and policymakers and also payers. And so we really need to educate a very broad universe, multiple audiences, um, and also patients. Uh, so uh, across uh, different audiences. And so it's, it's, it's fairly uh, complicated. And uh, you know, I wish I had more capital to put at it uh, because it's important for us to do that. Uh, you know, we do everything that we can with the limited resources that we have. And we, you know, the, the tough part of running a startup is, is resource allocation. Uh, but yeah, there is a plan for that. It's integrated across um, across channels and uh, focused on you know multiple audiences. Okay. What was part B uh, of that question? Yeah. So the second part is, um, can you get a leading consumer advocate or well-known personality on board, like a public service announcement kind of campaign? Oh yeah, absolutely. We actually already have to. <laughs> so um, many of you may have seen the uh, pharmacist docu series on Netflix. Um, it's a four part docu series uh, that came out last year. They're making a feature film out of it. We uh, signed the title character early last year. Maybe it was late the year before Dan Schneider. If you haven't seen it, it's a, it's a wonderful documentary and he is a um, just a great salt of the earth person. Um, we don't use him as much as we use Camille Schreier. Camille is uh, the former, Miss, she's the reigning Miss America, actually. Um, she is a pharmacy student getting her PhD at, uh, I think it's Virginia Tech. Uh, but she, her whole platform uh, during her reign as Miss America has been mind your meds uh, because of the diversion potential from the home medicine cabinet, right? And so it's all been all, her platform has been all about medication safety. We signed her last year. She does PSA work for uh, us in Ohio. She's done some trade show work for us. She's done some videos for us. Uh, we can actually get you a couple of videos. There's probably a, a one or two on our website uh, from one or more of those two. But yeah, we do have spokespeople. Uh, you know, we tried getting um, a couple of others, but uh, from the uh, music industry landscape, but uh, we didn't have enough resources to try to continue that project. It was going to be another. Uh, we are the world uh, with, um, God, I'm blanking on his name. I'm not, I'm not up to date on the pop stars <laughs> these days, <laughs> but uh, 
But uh, yeah, we do have uh, celebrity endorsers and we uh, do use them, you know, in our communication strategy. And Camille has really been the best. You know, she came media trained and all of that stuff. And so she's been a great partner for us. But yeah, thank you for asking. We do have some, some celebrity folks. Okay, that's great. Um, how much have you raised so far and at what terms? Yeah, so we did, uh, uh, I think we're over 8 million now. Um, our first three rounds were convertible note rounds. Um, we had to do a down round right at the height of COVID because we were caught uh, kind of with our pants down. We had about 10 to uh, 12 weeks of cash and we were topping off a prior round and did a, um, a uh, and we're starting to launch the institutional round. Of course, many of our uh, institutional round investors are healthcare focused. And when COVID hit, they said, sorry, we have to triage our portfolio. We're not doing any new deals, call us back in a year. Um, and so the institutional round evaporated. Uh, the private investors, uh, which are primarily ultra high net worth individuals uh, in that round we were topping off, um, basically said, my allocation uh, discipline just went through the roof, completely unbalanced, said, I'm not doing anything new right now, I'm sorry. And so we had to do a down round, but you know we had 80% uh, existing investor participation in that round. And the way that we worked that round is I basically gave up my equity to the investors and said, if you come in and do your pro rata in this round, you can recapture 86% uh, of your dilution. Uh, and then the equity catch up for me, I'd subordinated in the form of a promote that's based on investor return. So I only earn that back as I produce uh, larger and larger uh, returns to our investors over time. I was glad to do that. Um, we had 80 plus percent participation from the existing group. Uh, many of our uh, larger, more sophisticated investors actually used the opportunity to upsize their uh, ownership position uh, in the business. And so that was a really successful round during the height of COVID. Literally our first closing on that round was in uh, early May of uh, 2020. Uh, and then the more recent round is uh, this uh, seed two round. Post money on that prior round was six. Uh, the uh, pre-money on this was uh, eight and a half, but we structured it in a way that enabled us to remove promotes over time as we hit our milestones. And so now we're selling at 10. Um, and so, uh, you know, we've been very successful in fundraising. We've been lucky. We have a good story and a great mission, and we've got a lot of committed investors, uh, many of whom understand the space and understand the uh, you know, the pathway to reimbursement and, and uh, just what it takes to launch and succeed in healthcare today with a new product or service line. So uh, we've been very fortunate, but we've raised over 8 million. And, uh, you know, this round has been no different. We had great uh, existing investor participation in the pro rata. Um, we've had a couple large checks come in. We, um, you know, have about a million to a million and a half left in the 3 million total target. So so yeah, that's, uh, I think that answers the question. Yeah, it does. That's great. Um, and also a follow-up to that is, do all the notes convert to equity in this in this series seed two round? Oh no, those three, I'm sorry, those three prior convertible note rounds converted into equity at the prior, in the prior seed round. So it's all equity capitalized today. Okay. Um, and this is our last question that we have. It is, are you in... Are they interested in an outright acquisition or a licensing or royalty kind of deal? What would be the timetable for exit? Uh, so I'll go back to our exit slide. And I presume by uh, they, they mean us, the uh, company here. Yeah, I, I believe that's you guys. Okay. <laughs> All right. Good. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, with our vial business, uh, you know, we, ex we would expect a nine to 10 digit exit in that uh, business. We would sell that business here on the uh, left side of your screen with a very narrowly defined exclusive license to use the IP solely in prescription vials and then retain the IP at the CCI level, which is where all of our investors invest for that continued monetization in those, uh, in those other packaging categories. Now, we could exit that business uh, at any time, uh, but I think probably, uh, you know, and we'll do the math when it comes around, uh, when the opportunity comes around. But I think the, uh, the best way to monetize and capture all the value under the curve for us is going to be via licensing. And I think what we'll probably end up doing is doing a couple of exclusive licenses up front with some short-term uh, durations on them. 
uh, and get upfront proceeds to mitigate any future fundraising requirement and maybe return some capital to investors um, and then uh, and then you know monetize via licensing. But in the vial business, I want to go back to that for just a second because I mentioned earlier the nexus on our best uh, premium exit opportunity is probably right in that uh, 25 to 27 time frame, and it's when we have visibility on that two billion revenue opportunity after having achieved it for Schedule Two nationwide, and then uh, potentially have the visibility or maybe have already achieved it for the rest of controls, the rest of controlled substances and have the visibility on that pediatric fatality risk medication that is that uh, much larger revenue opportunity, moving us from 700 in controlled substances to about 2 billion in total. Uh, and if we uh, have the visibility on that, I think uh, folks are gonna need to pay us a very, very significant premium uh, for that bio business to uh, retain their status uh, and position in the industry, because otherwise we'll put them out of business. So that's our exit okay. strategy. Uh, first exit is 26, you know, call it 26 plus or minus a couple of years on the vial business. And then I think our first distributions on royalties could probably start maybe sometime late 24 would be the answer. Okay, great. Thank you so much, Milton. Um, so we're about out of time. So I'd like to, to turn it over to Milton if you have any um, closing remarks. And then after that, we'll, we'll turn the time over to Tien and We'll close the meeting. Yeah, terrific. So, uh, you know, great being uh, here with you all today. Thanks very much for listening to the story. The only thing I would add is, you know, Tian and I uh, have uh, have uh, known each other for some time now. I want to say at least fifteen to twenty years, uh, Tian. And uh, yeah. Tian was an investor in a prior business of mine, um, either through an entity or as part of a group uh, that we exited. Uh, I want to say about a year and a half back. Actually, the last I think final distribution just came, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, Tian. I hope you got yours. The, um, and so we've known each other for quite some time. We were very successful with that business. We took that from a $6 million uh, revenue platform, a small regional player, to about a $48 million uh, revenue national competitor uh, in the outsource maintenance category uh, by the time that I left uh, the business. And um, so really took it to, you know, at that scale, at its time, it was probably a top 20 business in the country. Uh, for outsourced maintenance um, uh, services, uh, you know, for building owners and operators. And, and uh, so that was a largely successful exit. The turnaround that I just co I completed here before, uh, before coming to uh, commercialize this product uh, was successful. I took that from, you know, I want to say six uh, lines of business down to two. Uh, and also, uh, but it was a mess. I mean, I had to renegotiate credit agreements right out of the gate find a new bank, a replacement bank, uh, bank within the first seven months. Uh, and so, you know, I've, uh, I've taken uh, businesses through uh, lots of challenges, both uh, at the board level and as a, you know, private equity investor and also as an operator. And, you know, the challenge here for us is, um, you know, growing the business today in clinical verticals. It uh, literally, we have so many repeat customers right now. It's, it's, um, you know, that's just a matter of execution and hiring. And can we, you know, can we execute on that? And then, you know, this uh, makes so much uh, economic sense uh, from a reimbursement perspective that that is really just a matter of time to me. Uh, and so, uh, so, you know, I'm here and committed to the business. Uh, I've been successful before. I know what we need to do. And it's, uh, like I said, I believe it's just a matter of time for us here in the vial business. Um, you know, before this becomes as ubiquitous as your push down and turns that you all have in your medicine cabinets at home today. Uh, so thanks very much for listening. I'd love to have you as part of the group. We have a great group of investors. Um, happy to share uh, any material in the VDR under NDA. We also have a bunch of uh, uh, FAQ diligence items that we send out without people signing an NDA, uh, things on our IP, things on um, the clinical verticals growth plan, and other information that you might find useful in your review. Um, like I said, we uh, are down to about a million to a million and a half in the round. So we'd love to uh, have you dig in uh, as quickly as, uh, as you can. We'd love to, um, to get this round done and behind us so that we can focus on executing. So super appreciate you listening. Thanks for listening to the story. Hope you'll join us in our important mission. Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Milton. Great story. As Milton said, uh, my partners and I invested in Milton when he was CEO, we had a successful exit, very happy with it. And um, 
you know, I'm just so thrilled to see you and Karen Closures make such great progress and hitting milestone after milestone and getting traction. So I know you guys are poised for great things to come and, and thank you guys for joining us. I hope you'll invest in Karen Closures. Thanks everybody. We do have a communication coming out with some more call times for you to dig in further. And we're also happy to schedule one-on-one -on -one times as, uh, as you see fit. Thanks very much for listening. Bye everybody. Thank you.